for part two of our lecture three, instead we are going to have a um, opinionated uh, sequence of things that are bad or good while coding in this kind of parallel environments or while coding in general, if you prefer. And so I have this interesting list that is, I would say, definitely controversial, you know? Using threads directly is bad. Communication between processes is bad. Writing parallel programs, it's, it's bad. Writing a Fissence program, it's bad. And in general, writing programs is a very bad idea. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to defend all of those points and try to make you understand what I mean behind them. Using threads directly, it's bad. Creating or starting a thread is very costly. It's very hard to find the right number of threads that should run in parallel in any given moment of time. Uh, there is a limit on how many threads can be alive at the same time, even if they can't possibly run. It's easy to fall in a trap of non-modular reasoning, assuming that you know what the other parts of your program are doing. And in particular, how many threads they are using. Often this is just an implementation detail and so you don't really know it. And so if you write a piece of code that is embedded into a bigger program, you don't know. You don't know how many threads have already been used and how many threads you should reasonably be able to use. To solve this problem, many libraries offer the concept of tasks and thread pools. And indeed, the thread pools are going to be one of the main topics of this course. And a thread pool conceptually is just a resource containing and managing many threads. In this way, you don't have to create the threads yourself. You can have a library that creates the threads for you. So a thread pool is just this opaque collection containing threads. And you can think about the thread pool as a temporary job agency. Remember, we have this idea of those workers that take tasks and do them. Well, those workers may work for a temporary job agency. And so you can submit tasks to the pool and the pool will provide a worker. And when the task is over, the worker will just go back to the pool. Communication between processes. It's bad. There are a lot of scary words around it. There is deadlock, livelock, starvation, race conditions, non-deterministic behavior, and many other very scary words. There are some issues that are surprising. They're not even scary. They are surprising. They are uh, worse than scary. They are so alien that we don't even recognize them as problems that we should worry about. We have issues of cache coherence. We have little nasty details on the various memory model in the programming language you're using. And the compiler may reorder your instruction in certain specific cases. And you may only observe this if you are doing communication between processes. Um, long and double in Java can access the processor word length. And so you may end up only copying half of a double to the new area. Uh, we will discuss about those issues more in the course, but I think I've proved my point here. Thankfully, there are solutions, mostly in the form of programming patterns. So we can have the fork join model to keep in our head. And if we follow the fork join correctly, we should not have those kind of problems. We have MapReduce frameworks. And in some sense, the streams are a MapReduce up to a point and also a fork join. It's interesting because they manage to be both. We, we will also explore actor system in the last part of the course. Generally speaking, those are all libraries that define how we can work over data that follows a functional interface. That is, every task should take some input in and produce some output out without mutating the input or other objects. However, 
to use those popular solutions, we have to code in this very specific style that is not just a functional style, it is a functional style suitable for the parallel stream, for example. And this very specific style, it's very often the good one. So if you don't have very good reasons for not wanting to code in this style, code in this style. And I don't want to spend 10 hours learning to code in this style is not a good reason. Also, in order to use those libraries, we need to know those libraries, we need to know that they exist and we need to know how to use them decently. And at the start, it may look like a big deal, but trust me, on the long term, knowing how not to use them, it's a much, much harder. And now going to the more uh, extreme statement that I've done at the start, writing parallel programs is bad. Even if no variable or field is used as a communication between running workers, a parallel program can still refer to multiple system resources at the same time. In this way, you could, for example, corrupt your own file. Moreover, even if you think there is no communication between running workers, maybe you are wrong. If there is an alias in bug that you haven't considered properly, you may have that this bug manifests as a hidden point of communication between uh, workers, threads, or processes. Overall, trying to write efficient programs is bad. You should focus on correctness and simplicity. Simplicity. Try to write the code in the shortest possible way you can. Even go to code golfing lengths and then once the code is as short as you can make it, try to make it more understandable, try to make it better formatted with more meaningful identifier and comments. But until you know what is the shortest code, the simplest possible code that you can write that correctly solve the problem, your job as a programmer is not over. You don't just have to write a version of code that somehow passed the tests today. Then, if this uh, minimalized code is not fast enough, then you can do some kind of profiling. For example, look to this link that talks about JMH, that is a very famous uh, profiling tool for micro benchmark in Java. And once you found where is the problem in your code, then you can apply uh, sophisticated libraries to make the code faster in that area. Overall, writing programs, it's, it's bad. And I mean, I'm not joking here. And I've spent the last like 20 years of my life focusing day and night how to become the best possible programmer ever. So how am I saying that writing programs is bad? Well, yes, it's bad. And the bigger the program, the bigger the evil. What I mean is that the program in itself should just be a little piece of code in the main that customize, wire and invoke a handful of libraries. So writing libraries is good. And even if you're going to be the only one using them, try to write your code and try to write the most complicated part of your application logic as an independent library, a library that take care of the logic of your application without other aspects, maybe. In this way, that library could be used as bare minimum two times, one time in production and one time in testing. If you just have a program that is not modularly divided into library, testing it is much more challenging. If your program is conceptually divided in meaningful modular library-like pieces of code, you can test those in isolation. So, as a final words, using threads directly is bad, communication between processes is bad, writing parallel programs is bad, Writing efficient programs is bad and writing programs 
is bad. It's good to write modular functionalities with clear input-output boundaries that could potentially be used as a library in other programs. Write tests and stress tests. You are not knowing if you have or not a performance problem if you don't have repeatable stress tests. And when you found an efficiency issue, then before resorting to parallelism, try all the other kinds of optimization. Only when you are really desperate, resource to parallelism. Don't recreate the wheel. Please learn to use reusable abstractions. Your handcrafted solution may be correct and maybe is faster but maybe it's faster only on your local machine. If you don't have the resources to test your code on a wide range of different computers, hardware, operative system and configurations, you have no clue what is the efficiency of your code. You just have no clue. The fact that they're running faster on your machine is absolutely irrelevant. And then, <laughs> I will say something that again is quite surprising. Use low level feature as a last resource only. If you need to use those kind of last resource tools, you are probably doing some cutting edge research, trying to revolutionate what humanity think is possible to do with computing. And you should demand to be paid accordingly if that's what you are doing. So, how to say, uh, as a rule of thumb, either you're not paid what you worth, or you have no hope to do low-level efficient and concurrent parallelism. Uh, seriously, uh, even the best researchers and programmers in the world get it wrong all of the time. It is exceptionally challenging it's harder than most uh, mathematical proofs to write correct parallel code without relying on those high level abstractions that we see in this course. Okay, this is the end for today. See you next week for lecture four.